My name is uh, Bill Abram. I'm a retired high school teacher. I uh, uh, retired uh, in 1987 to find out why a number of my students were being hit with uh, drugs, and I wondered where those drugs were coming from. And as a result of that, I found that behind the scenes in Canada, in the United States, is an organization that has no care for social issues. All they care for is making money, and the drugs were just part of that. And as I uh, looked into the situation of uh, the behind-the-scenes drug dealing, I discovered that the creation of money was also uh, in that big picture of control over people. The more I discovered uh, uh, the uh, machinations that uh, the international bankers go through to control us, the more I realized that the theft of our efforts, our resources, and our labors was phenomenal, was colossal. At that point, I got introduced to uh, a graph that the Auditor General in Canada in 1993 put out, which showed the phenomenal theft that happens as a result of the, um, the power of interest and the sleight of hand economics of compounding interest. And I discovered this graph at that time, uh, which I would like to show you here, uh, of the degree of the theft that was taking place in Canada. Now, this is the Auditor General's report of November 1993. And here in Canada, this would put the, uh, uh, the sponsorship scandal to absolute shame. The sponsorship scandal does not compare with the theft that happens when a government, instead, instead of borrowing from itself, creating its own money, which only the government has the right to create, they give it over to private entities like the international banks or the private banks, the government prints a bond, the private banks then turn that bond into printed dollars, and then the government borrows those printed dollars back, according to the bond. And from way back, 1867 to 1992, when this report was prepared, uh, Canada had to borrow for real spending, no more than $37 billion. Yet, in 1993, our national debt stood at $423 billion. $386 billion of that was simply interest on interest. Now, if this isn't a an unnecessary theft, I don't know what is. This is billions of dollars we're talking about. If I can fast track right up to today's situation, James Flaherty, our finance minister, has put out this particular booklet. This is uh, last year's uh, financial uh, uh, budget, and uh, our, our 2007 one has just been approved, but this was sent out to all the members of parliament uh, across the country. And it's called Canada's New Government, Turning a New Leaf. Now, inside this particular uh, booklet is a statement of how much we pay in interest and how much our national debt is. Now, I have taken the numbers that are here. Uh, the interest that we had to pay in 2004-2005 was $34.1 billion on a national debt of $494.4 billion. The next year we paid roughly the same, $33.7 billion. That's 2005, 2006, 2006, 2007, 34.8 billion, and the projected uh, amount we'll pay in 2007, 2008, 30, a total of 137.4 billion dollars will be paid over that four-year period to bankers who, from whom we've borrowed the money uh, to buy the goods and services that we need uh, for the country. Now, when you go back in history, you cannot help but find that statements time and time again, money exists not by nature but by law. And if money exists by law, why is it produced by the private banks then? What right do they have? Would you give it to the private banks or would you give it to the, uh, um, the police force? Would you give it to the mafia? Who would you allow to print the money that the nation needs if it is created by law? The only people who have the legal right to create money is the 
federal government or the government of the people because they are accountable to the people. And uh, we're only paying out this huge sum of interest because our governments fail to uh, abide by the law and print the money which only they have the exclusive right to. And in Canada, under in the Canadian Constitution of 1867, Article 91 states very clearly that only the government has the cre exclusive right to create the nation's money. And this same clause is in the American Constitution. Yet, governments will go to private banks and allow them to create the money. In 1934, in Canada, we were in the midst of a depression, we created a bank called the Bank of Canada, and it was given the right to create the money for Canada. And the money that was being created by the private banks was phased out then over the next 10 years. So what we really had was what was called legal tender. But gradually, because of uh, uh, the way the promise to pay money, check money, the banks got control of all of our uh, money creation again through check money and promise to pay money, M2 money. We have the Bank of Canada Act of 1934, and uh, it did spell out clearly that the government should create the money and the Bank of Canada should lend the money, not lend it, but spend it into existence uh, for social and uh, uh, public projects. The United States, since the Federal Reserve Act of uh, 1913, uh, the creation of money in the United States has been totally in the hands of a private consortium known as the Federal Reserve uh, Group. But we in Canada have the laws on our books, and the Bank of Canada Act has not been changed. The preamble reads the same. The clauses in the Bank of Canada Act are still there. The only thing that is lacking in Canada is that our politicians uh, do not abide by the Act and do not uh, force our... Uh, our government to print the nation's money. In Canada, the, um, all the shares for the Bank of Canada are held on behalf of the people by our finance minister, our federal finance minister. And he has final say uh, by law on uh, the creation of money for Canada. In the United States, they do not have that uh, freedom. In the United States, the Federal Reserve is totally unaccountable to the people. And uh, the politicians, many of them, have bought the idea that, uh, oh, the Federal Reserve, they're, they're a government agency and they print it. But no, indeed, they print it, but they lend it to the government, and that puts the people in debt. And uh, the mathematics of that is that uh, the United States can never get out of debt. Ho however, if you go through U.S. history, you'll find that uh, way back in the 1850s, uh, Andrew Jackson did managed to control the creation of money in the United States, and that is the only time in history that the United States ever was debt-free. But by law, if our politicians follow the law, we should never ever have a national debt, not especially Canada, where we have such a vast array of resources. We should want for nothing. It opened its doors in 1935, uh, March the 11th, uh, 1935, and immediately the Bank of Canada then started printing real legal tender that was printed on behalf of the people, and they started to end the depression of the 30s by uh, sending out uh, checks of legal tender then to the farmers across the West or to various places where um, people needed workers to pay the workers. In, in my own experience, I know that my dad was getting $20 a month for grading a roadside, and this was real legal tender. And the Depression in Canada started to come to an end at that point. So that was 37, 38, 
uh, we were coming out of the depression while other parts of the world uh, were still burdened. During the war years, we actually created the third largest navy in the world. Uh, this was by putting everybody to work. And money represents what people create. Of course, we were destroying uh, so much of what we were creating, but nevertheless, because we were using our own money, we did not go into any great national debt. And I have a chart here that uh, will show the history of uh, the Bank of Canada from its creation, or particularly from 1940, until it got to, uh, removed from proper use by the international banking cartel, and then our debt began to rise. Now, this is my history, actually, of my life. I was born in 1928, and I recall the Depression years, and uh, the Bank of Canada was created, as I said, in 1934. The war started in 1939, and the government then was producing all the money that was needed to build the factories, to build the airplanes, and uh, to build the ships. And as you can see by this graph, and this is uh, the uh, from Statistics Canada, the figures, uh, we did not peak high uh, for a national debt. And once the war ended, the uh, soldiers who came back uh, were all put to work. They were either given a, a university education, free tuition, or they were uh, given a, a VLA, which is a Veterans Land uh, Act uh, grant, to go into business or start a farming. And this was all money given on behalf of the people to the people who returned. And to keep everyone busy, at that point, we built the St. Lawrence Seaway. We built the Trans-Canada Highway. We built the railways. We did own the CNR at that time, and it was our national railway. We continued to create uh, up to about 37% of our national uh, money was spent into existence to create infrastructure and social services. During this period of time, we gave family allowance uh, for uh, families, for children's benefit. Uh, we built up the colleges. We uh, uh, brought in uh, old age pensions. And uh, we brought in Medicare. Now, that continued very nicely the government funding from the Bank of Canada and the Bank of Canada spending the money into existence. And at this point, the uh, international bankers, uh, the Bank for International Settlements and the, the uh, World Bank and the IMF uh, started to put the squeeze on politicians and said, you are encroaching on the services that the banks give. You should not be printing the money that the people need. We should be. And immediately we started to go into debt. And these figures only go to 1987. However, uh, uh, the, the debt actually rose up to 600 billion. But in 1987, our national debt stood at 523.3 billion. Uh, this is the history of Canada. Now, from here, there was there were no food banks in Canada that I knew of. There were no homeless people. Uh, lotteries were illegal. <laughs> Uh, we didn't have to have runs to finance uh, medical care or uh, cancer uh, research. Uh, Canada thrived through those years. We also set up Canada as a peacekeeping nation during those years. So we have a proud history from 1935, basically, until about 1974. And I would like to point out that here, in 1974, our national debt stood at a mere $18 billion dollars. During this period of time, a lot of Canadian companies could be self-financing. Once the international bankers uh, began to get control of uh, uh, policy through government, get control of government, uh, the international bankers, the private banks, encouraged uh, expansion of uh, Canadian-owned industries. Oh, you, you can borrow from us. And the process of putting nations, putting corporations, putting companies, putting peoples into debt began. And from that point on, uh, the uh, encouragement was, well, borrow from us. No one seemed to realize that when they borrowed from a private entity like that, that was not real money. That was putting your own uh, um, assets at risk. Uh, and as a result, we lost the Canadian National Railways through this. 
and Canadian National Railways was just such an incredible railway system. Uh, it just crisscrossed uh, the country in more ways with spur lines than our highways are today, and they serviced the people. But that was got rid of, and uh, so the goods and services now are transported by truck rather than rail, and we do not own Canadian National Railways anymore. The only thing Canadian about it is that it's still called Canadian National Railways. Oh, I like to think of Canada, what Canada would look like if we got control of our money system. We would not sell any schools to finance education. We would build more schools. We would get smaller classes. We would build the best educational tools and install them into the schools so that the people understood, our children grew up understanding what a rich land we are and understanding principally what qualities of life uh, they can have if they get the benefit of their labors through life. Uh, we would have no unemployment. Uh, we would have uh, lots of holiday time, uh, uh, but we'd keep everyone working and everyone would be producing according to their own natural inner creative abilities. And yes, we would recognize that there are some people who uh, haven't been uh, as fortunate as others with uh, their mental uh, abilities. Uh, but there, there is a place for everyone, and we would find that place, and we would be a happy, happy land. We would not exploit territories for profit. Ethical financing is, means that we are evolving to a higher moral standard, and that is a good thing. Dr. Muhammad Yunus is a perfect example with uh, uh, his bank, which actually deals in billions of dollars now. Poverty is not caused by the poor people. Poverty is caused by the system we built. Poverty is caused by the policies that we pursue. Grameen Bank has made a significant contribution to reducing poverty in Bangladesh. Since Grameen's creation in the 1970s, life expectancy has risen more than 20 years. The fertility rate has been cut in half. It is estimated that each year, 200,000 Grameen members and their families escape poverty. That process has been used effectively we don't need uh, that kind of thing in Canada because we already do create our own money through the Bank of Canada. We just don't make use of the Bank of Canada because uh, it's, it's not... Uh, our governments don't control the banking and the creation of money. But alternate banking systems do exist and they are very effective where people can manage to hold it together. May it be an shines down upon you may it be when darkness falls your heart once people understand that money is not something mysterious but that money is something that we each create when we give of ourselves in some way either in goods or services and it should represent nothing more than that exchange of goods and services. And it's not a difficult concept. It is so simple that as John Kenneth Galbraith stated, the mind is repelled. The creation of money is so simple that the mind is repelled. And yet, through obfuscation, through blurry funding, confusing statements, uh, the ordinary people do not understand. But once they understand, uh, there'd be a revolution by before morning. That's what Henry Ford stated way back when. The study of money, above all other fields in economics, is one in which complexity is used to disguise truth, not reveal it. Now, here's a quote that we really must grasp, and this is where our downfall is, is because most people don't grasp it, because it is de deliberately uh, confused. Of all the contrivances for cheating the laboring classes of mankind, none has been more effective than that which deludes them with paper money. When people understand what is being perpetrated on them, they will uh, speak out, just as a number of good congressmen in the United States have. Uh, I have here a quote from Congressman Wright Patman. I have never yet had anyone who could, through the use of logic and reason, justify the federal government borrowing the use of its own money. There's another statement by him that I have here. 
which says there is not a single person within range of my voice who does not know that the Federal Reserve is an illegal organization that puts people into debt unnecessarily. Right, Patman, in Canada, the best question for that is, answer for that is um, Gerald Grattan McGear. And uh, we could do a documentary on Gerald Grattan McGear. He was, uh, should have been listed as Canadians, Canada's greatest Canadian. In 1935, he single handedly, uh, he was a brilliant lawyer, a King's Counsel, uh, uh, an MP at that time and uh, also a legislator he, uh, in the BC government for a number of years, but he single-handedly um, caught the, um, the, the Macmillan Commission, which was sent out from Britain, the Lord Macmillan Commission, uh, to fix our economy. He caught them and talked to them as if they were a bunch of freshmen in college, and as a result of uh, Gerald Grattan McGeer, the Bank of Canada became a reality, and his recommendations are the base of the Bank of Canada Act, and they still are law. But there is no question about it that banks create the medium of exchange. That is right. That is what they're for. That is the banking business, just in the same way that a steel plant makes steel. The manufacturing process consists of making a pen and ink or typewriter entry on a card in a book. That's all. Each and every time a bank makes a loan or purchases security, new bank credit is created, new deposits, brand new money. Broadly speaking, all new money comes out of a bank in the form of loans. As loans are debt, then under the present system, all money is debt. When one million dollars worth of bonds is presented to the bank, a million dollars of new money or the equivalent is created? Yes. Is it a fact that a million dollars of new money is created? That's right. Now the same thing holds true when a municipality or a province goes to the bank. Or an individual borrower. When a private person goes to the bank? Yes. When I borrow a hundred dollars from the bank as a private citizen, the bank makes a bookkeeping entry and there is a one hundred dollar increase in the deposits of that bank, in the total deposits of that bank. Yes. Mr. Towers, when you allow the merchant banking system to issue bank deposits, which, with the practice of using the checks as we have it in vogue today, constitutes the medium of exchange upon which I think 95% of our public and private business is transacted, you virtually allow the banks to issue an effective substitute for money, do you not? The bank deposits are actual money in that sense, yes. In that sense that they are actual money, but as a matter of fact, they are not actual money, but credit, bookkeeping accounts, which are used as a substitute for money. Yes. Then we authorize the banks to issue a substitute for money. Yes, I think that's a very fair statement of banking. 12% of the money in use in Canada is issued by the government through the Mint and the Bank of Canada and 88% is issued by the Merchant Banks of Canada on the reserves issued by the Bank of Canada. Yes. If the issue of currency and money is a high prerogative of government, then that high prerogative has been transferred to the extent of 88% from the government to the Merchant Banking System. Yes. Will you tell me why a government with power to create money should give that power away to a private monopoly and then borrow that which Parliament can create itself back at interest to the point of national bankruptcy? If Parliament wants to change the form of operating the banking system, then certainly that is within the power of Parliament. Gerald Grattan McGeer questioned the Commission for over three and a half hours. Representing the Vancouver Trades and Labor Council, McGeer told the Commission it was trying to patch up an ox cart and that Canadian banking was a credit racket that was strangling commercial life. 
the Macmillan Commission, which was sent out from Britain, the Lord Macmillan Commission, uh, to fix our economy, he cowed them and talked to them as if they were a bunch of freshmen in college. And as a result of uh, Gerald Grattan McGeer, the Bank of Canada became a reality, and his recommendations are the base of the Bank of Canada Act, and they still are law.